Okay, here we go, everyone. Thank you. Welcome to today's University of Texas uh, at Austin's Energy Institute's Energy Symposium for September 6, 2022. I'm Terry King, Assistant Director and Research Scientist at the Energy Institute. Um, and today, before I discuss our two speakers for today, I will highlight the upcoming talks of the next two weeks. So next week, we will have a talk from Ian Duncan, also here at the University of Texas at Austin, and he will talk about generating hydrogen in the subsurface. So uh, that'll be an interesting talk. How do you create hydrogen uh, underground from resources underground uh, and create the hydrogen there? Uh, and then September 20th, the following week, we'll have a talk by Nathan Higgins or Nate Higgins. He's the director of the Institute for the Study of Energy in Our Future. And this will be a high level view of sort of energy and the economy, a big systems view of how everything works together. So two good upcoming talks uh, today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, two postdoctoral fellows that have been working with myself and uh, several others here at the University of Texas as part of what we're calling this micro to macro modeling initiative. And so first we'll have Paula Subramanian Sambasivam. And after that, we will have Suman Sara, And they will talk about uh, their two modeling approaches that they're doing to try to understand micro to macro. So a little biography on Bala, uh, as he goes for short, um, his postdoctoral fellow with the Energy Institute and working in the operations research and industrial engineering program. And he has a PhD in energy transitions and sustainability from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India. He has a master's in renewable energy from the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, following Bala will be Suman, and he's a postdoctoral fellow here at the Energy Institute. Uh, he has a PhD in engineering sciences from Southern Illinois University. And both of them have interests in understanding energy system broadly, energy transitions. Uh, more generally. Uh, so here are the titles for their talk. Bala's talk is Optimal Resource Placement for Electric Grid Resilience via a Network Topology. So he's gonna be looking at a sort of mathematical grid-based level of how uh, energy flows in the electric grid. And then Suman has an agent-based approach to studying energy and economic coupling in a limited resource society. So we're gonna have a simple uh, sort of model of an economy and model it in two different ways and try to uh, see how we can learn from an agent-based approach to this modeling. I'll leave their abstracts here for posterity in the recordings, but I will not read these uh, more fully. So here's the abstract for Bala's presentation. And here's the abstract for Suman's presentation. And with that said, and having presented this information, uh, I will now stop sharing and hand it over to Bala to get started. Each of them will speak for about uh, 20 minutes each. And we'll hold questions until the end so we can get through both presentations and then uh, submit your questions at any time uh, you would like in the Q&A feature of Zoom. And Bala, please go ahead and share your screen and get started. Yeah, thank you, Dr. King, for the introduction. So, uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today. I am Bala. Postdoctoral Research Fellow as part of Energy Institute Micro to Macro Initiative at UT Austin. Today, the topic of my presentation is Optimal Resource Placement for Electric Grid Resilience via Network Topology. This work I have done with Connor, PhD student in ORIE, and under the guidance of Dr. Hasenbein and Dr. Leibovitz faculties in ORIE. So in the recent years, there has been significant disruptions to the electricity networks due to Superstorm Sandy and the hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. In 2017 and 18, the total damages due to these events were about $3.3 and $3 billion, respectively. In the line of these latest natural disasters, the latest one is Winter Storm Uri, which caused huge economic and human losses in Texas in February. 2021. So post this disaster, more than 4 million people were left without electricity for almost a week. Also for an average of 42 hours, 16% of Texans did not have access to electricity. Annually, the total cost of 
power interruptions in the US is about $44 billion. So all these issues have increased the focus on electricity grid resilience study. So res what is resilience? Resilience refers to the ability of the electricity system to recover quickly after a major disaster and adapt its structure and operation style to mitigate the impact of future e extreme events. So according to the Presidential Policy Directive 21, which defines grid resilience as the ability to prepare and plan for, absorb, recover from, or more successfully adapt to actual or potential adverse events. Due to the increasing frequency of natural disasters, there has been an increasing number of publications on critical infrastructures and network resilience in the last few years. These studies on grid resilience can be categorized into optimization models and conceptual studies. However, the common limitation with these optimization models are they are highly data intensive computational models with focus on specific case studies. Whereas the uh, conceptual studies list the collection of inputs from experts for enhancing grid resilience. So having studied the literature, so here we are proposing our objective. The objective here is to study the reliability of alternative electric grid configurations by adapting a stylized approach based on graph theory and probabilistic analysis and simulation. For this, we are considering two alternative classes of electric network topology. One is the binary tree and the other one is rectangular lattice. For each topology, we derive the probabilities that customers located at various nodes in the network will continue to have power following a disaster depending on the locations of the resources in the network. Then these probabilities are incorporated into the problem of optimally placing resources throughout the network. This is a cost benefit problem that weighs the benefits of placing resources closer to customers that is pursuing a distributed resilience strategy against the higher total cost of deploying a greater number of smaller resource units. The results from the study shows that in the binary tree, when the resource is placed far away from the consumers, the probability of customer obtaining power is less. And whereas it is opposite in the case of the rectangular lattice topology. So now we're getting to the problem. This is a binary tree. In the binary tree, every node has two child nodes. The leaves in the binary tree are considered as customers. The R represents the resources and C represents the customers. Here, the assumption is power always flows from a resource node to a consumer node. The height of the binary tree is given by H and the layer in which the resource is placed is represented by G. So in this figure, we can see what are all the alternative resource placement possibilities in the binary tree topology. For example, if there is only one resource at layer G equal to zero, there are two edges and two consumers. For example, if the resource is placed at G equal to one, then the resource at G equal to zero becomes irrelevant and there are four edges and four consumers. And when the resource at G equal to one, it looks like there are two small subtrees in the network. If the resource is placed at G equal to two, then the resource at G equal to one becomes irrelevant and there are eight edges and eight consumers. Also, when the resource is placed at G equal to two, there are four small subtrees. If the resource is placed at G equal to three like this, the resource at G equal to two becomes irrelevant and there are 16 edges and 16 consumers. Also, when the resource placed at G equal to three, there are eight small subtrees. So these are the different alternative resource placements possible in the binary tree topology. So here we are considering the edge success is in power transferring the power as P. If the edge fails in transferring the power is considered as one minus P and the edge failures are considered mutually independent. And then our objective is here to find the, identify the optimal layer to place the resources to provide power to customers. For example, let us consider a disaster scenario in a binary tree of height h equal to 4. And here, the resource is placed at the layer g equal to 0. 
a disaster like hurricane or sandstorm start the network there are some edges in the uh, network that fails because of the sand because of the extreme events so as you can observe that because of these edge failures some customers did not receive power also there is a possibility here if the resource is placed closer to the consumers there are high chance of customers receiving power so our objective is to find a trade off between the cost and the customers so which is the best for the uh, which is the which is the best possible solution so next our objective is to determine the expected number of customers with power the expectation of number of uh, leaves with power in the binary tree structure of high h and resource g is given by 2 to the power h p to the power h minus g as you can see the n1 n2 n2 to the power 2g are iid random variables that denote the number of leaves with power in each of the 2 to the power g subtrees where ni is iid and because of the recursive and recursive nature of the structure we are using linearity of expectation we have derived this expression paul maybe you mention just what iid stands for i i i iid is identically independent distributed uh, random variables uh, that is iid so the next uh, thing is uh, we are moving into the optimal resource placement so after identifying the expected number of customers the next step is to determine the optimal resource placement the problem here is designed as the maximization problem it maximizes the difference between benefit of having power and the cost of electricity supply so on the left hand side you can see the customer benefit is the product of number of customers with power and the benefit of have having power to the customers so the number of customers with power for a binary tree is identified from the expected value calculated from the previous step and the cost of the resource is identified uh, as the product of c not into 2 to the power r to the power g so where c not is the cost of resource placement at the root node and r is the ratio of unit cost between consecutive layers so when we are distributing the resources there is a possibility of um, uh, economies of scale we have to try to capture that using the r parameter and in the next step uh, we have tried to solve the problem uh, analytically by determining the optimal layer to place the resources for example in this equation if 2 pr is greater than 1 and the g star is between 0 and h then the uh, g star is the approximate solution to the optimization problem if g star is outside of this 0 and h interval then the solution is obtained at z g equal to 0 or g equal to h if 2 pr is less than 1 then the solution to the problem is obtained at g equal to 0 or g equal to h this is the analytical solution we we have derived and then after deriving the analytical solution we have plugged in some numerical values to identify how it will behave how, how the optimal resource placement the how the expression will behave we have tried to analyze that in the for example here in this example we have considered the binary tree of height h equal to 5 and the benefit of per home receiving power b is assumed at three times low compared to the cost of the resource for high and very high reliable networks as you can see from the bottom two figures the optimal layer to place the resources is at the root for example if there is a high probability of the network is receiving power then the placing the resources at the root is the optimal solution and in the next example we have just interchanged the benefit and the cost parameters uh, cost parameters and we had tried find this numerical analysis and here you can see the difference at the bottom two figures for example high reliable networks the optimal uh, layer to place the resources is coming uh, closer to the customers and then uh, when uh, for a very high reliable network in this case the optimal resources uh, optimal layer to place the resources is in the middle layers so this is the analysis related to the binary tree 
then we move into the rectangular lattice topology. So in the rectangular lattice, unlike binary tree in rectangular lattice, which nodes should be considered as leaves, it's not so obvious because in binary tree, every node has two child nodes. So those two nodes can be considered as consumers. But here in the rectangular lattice, this is not so obvious. So we assumed the boundary nodes in the lattice as the customers. Here too, our objective is to determine the probability that the customer located at the boundary nodes remain connected to a resource after a disaster. Uh, in binary tree, as you can see, we have an analytical solution. In rectangular lattice, we are not sure about the analytical solution. So we move to the simulation. So for our study, for our analysis, we have considered a 17 by 17 lattice. So the 17 by 17 lattice allows us to consider various regular resource placement of basic regular placements of resources on the network. The levels here, the levels in the network are divided into four quadrants of equal size. For example, in the 17 by 17 lattice, if there is a single resource placement on the center represented by the green color in the figure, the lattice can be divided into four equal nine by nine quadrants. Then if there is a resource placement in the center of each nine by nine quadrant, then it can be subdivided into four five by five quadrants that is represented by the yellow color in the figure. Then in the next stage, the resource placement in the center of the five by five lattice represented by the blue in the figure, then it can be subdivided into four three by three quadrants. Then if the resource placement is in the center of the three by three lattice represented by the rose color in the figure, it is subdivided into four two by two quadrants. The customers are denoted in the orange in the boundary nodes. The goal here, here is to compute the probabilities of boundary nodes having power in one quadrant. Since the lattice, rectangular lattice is a, uh, by, uh, is a symmetric structure, by symmetry, we can able to identify the solution for all the boundary nodes in the whole of the 17 by 17 lattice. Then for example, when after that, when we are uh, giving the, for example, if you consider the top right quadrant, and to under the top left quadrant, there are some uh, overlapping nodes. So when calculating the expected net benefit, these overlapping nodes are eliminated. And then we have calculated only for the non-overlapping nodes. So for example, if we consider this network, the, there are four overlapping nodes. So we have eliminated these nodes in calculating the expected net benefit. In the, for example, in the rectangular lattice, as you can see from the fig figure, numerous routes are possible from the resource to the customers. So due to pro problems combinatorial nature, it is difficult to produce tractable formulas. That's why we have taken the route of the simulation. So, so we have used the Monte Carlo simulation method. Uh, we have uh, produced 50,000 samples. So the, here also the edge success in power transfer is ca considered as P and the uh, edge failures as one minus P and we considering edge failures are mutually independent. We are assuming that. And then for each sample, a depth first algorithm is, is employed to determine uh, in that when if there is a path from the resource to each customer. These samples then provide the es estimate of the probability that each customer has power for various grid sizes and resource placements. So as I, as I said before, the simulation mo model of the lattice, we are analyzing only the upper right quadrant. For uh, analyzing the upper right quadrant alone, we are assuming that power flow only up or to the right in the upper right quadrant. This assumption aligns with the lattice model closely with the binary model in the assumption that the power flow outward from the resource to the customers. To compute the probabilities of boundary nodes having power in one quadrant, so it provides, by symmetry, it provides solution for all the boundary nodes. So in this figure, we can see in this figure some examples of the experimental probabilities we have obtained from simulation. When the probability of edge success in power transfer is assumed as 0.9, the simulation results for one quadrant of a 17 by 17 lattice with one resource placement is 
given in the left hand side and the four resource placement is shown in the right hand side in these figures the eighth row on the eighth column in the figure contain the probabilities of customers having power in one quadrant of 17 by 17 lattice with single resource placement so similarly in the right hand side figure the fourth row and the fourth column in figure contain the probabilities of customers having power in one quadrant of 17 by 17 lattice with four resource placement as we can observe from the figures that the probabilities in the rows and columns are similar so we have taken the average of these experimental probabilities z when calculating the expected net benefit so then in these figures we can see the uh, uh, probability of h success is assumed similar to 0.9 and here the simulation results for one quadrant of uh, with 12 resource placement and 28 resource placement. The, in the left hand side figure, in the three by three quadrant figure, the second row and second column in the figure and the first row and the first column in the figure gives the probabilities of customers having power in one quadrant of 17 by 17 lattice with 12 and 28 resource placements respectively. So after identifying the experimental probabilities, the next tip step is moving to identify the optimal resource placement here also again it's a cost benefit problem so the cost of having power to the consumers minus minus the cost of supply to the consumers so for example uh, use uh, the network's optimal level of resource placement can identify using the expected net benefit for example when considering the quadrants as discussed before, there are some overlapping customers. So we have eliminated the overlapping customers. And then the, for example, you can see that in the superscripts in brackets denotes zero, one, two, and three. The superscripts denotes the one, four, 12, and 28 resource placements respectively. There is a parameter Q, that Q denotes the cost to benefit ratio. So that is the benefit of per home receiving power to the cost of a uh, largest initial resource and Z is the experimental probabilities that we obtain through simulation and r is an economies of scale parameter so uh, then in the next step uh, similar to the binary tree we we have plugged in some numerical values to identify the numerical solution here for example in this case we have set the benefit to cost ratio q as very low 0 0.03 and for different values of uh, economies of r -ish, different values of r and for the probabilities of edge success in power transfer from point to one to one we have tried calculated the expected net benefit as we can observe in all these three cases the single resource placement uh, gives the highest net, net benefit and that is the optimal solution for this set of scenarios in the next example we have increased the q benefit to cost ratio q from 0 0.03 to 0 0.3 here we can observe that for very high reliable networks uh, uh, very uh, similar to the previous the optimal resource placement is the is placing the resource at the root is at the for single resource placement However, for moderately reliable networks like Pi and 6, Pi and 7, we can observe the, from the figure that the 12 resource, the 12 resource placement and the 28 resource placement, for example, here you can see moderately moderate for moderate reliable networks like Pi and 6 probability. In this case, the 28 resource placement is the optimal solution. And then here you can see for Pi and 7, once again, the 28 resource placement is the optimal solution. The second best is the 12 resource placement. So to conclude, so uh, this is a work in progress. Now in the next stage, we are trying to uh, comp uh, understand the possibility that is there a possibility to compare both the binary tree and rectangular lattice. So to conclude in the binary tree, when the benefit is high compared to the cost of resource, for very high reliable networks, the optimal resource placement is in the middle layers. When the benefit is low compared to the cost of resource for very high resource placement, the optimal uh, placement is at the root node. So when the whereas in the rectangular 
topology, when the benefit to cost ratio is very low, the optimal resource placement is at the root and the benefit to cost ratio is low for moderately reliable networks with low and medium economies of scale, 28 resource placement is the optimal solution. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Bala. So yeah. uh, stop sharing your screen and we will now shift to Suman and he will give his presentation and uh, then we'll take questions when Suman is completed. So please type your questions for Bala or Suman at any time in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. All right, unmute, Suman. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. King, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming and listening to me and giving me the opportunity to, opportunity to convey my idea, what I'm doing here at Energy Institute. Uh, like I already explained, I'm at the Energy Institute and working under the initiative micro to macro scaling of uh, uh, processes in energy and economics. And uh, this is something new to me. And right now I'm studying energy and economics, which is, just, I found a very coupled, interesting problem. And the approach which I took to study the energy and economics problem is aging-based modeling. And that's the topic I'm going to discuss. Uh, obviously, Dr. King is helping me with the study and uh, he's at Energy Institute. Professor Michael Martyr is at uh, Department of Physics. He's helping out with uh, uh, my studies. Uh, Professor Larry Lake at uh, Petroleum Engineering Department and Dr. Eric Abelson. He is also helping out uh, me with giving more uh, ideas how I can proceed with and make the, make my study better. So uh, we, all, we all know that uh, any economy, when I'm saying economy, any country, we consume energy. Uh, so US, uh, uh, Canada, China, we all consume energy and we produce some economic output like GDP. And to have a better economy or a bigger economy, more GDP, we need more uh, energy. And that produces a coupled problem. And my approach is to study the same problem with a chain based approach. So let's go with the presentation. Okay. So on my left, uh, I'm conveying the idea that energy and economics together make a coupled system. Uh, on my left, I'm presenting a very abstracted system of gas molecules just colliding with high energy in a closed box. Uh, so these gas molecules are essentially the micro part of a system. And the macro part is the box, the whole part the box with several gas molecules. Uh, the micro rules, for the microparticles is they have speed and the rules for them are they are colliding and they uh, very fundamental physical law for them is like when they collide they exchange some part of their momentum uh, if it's perfectly elastic half of the moment momentum and if not they lose some so the rules at micro scale are simple and these smaller particles have properties of speed but at macroscopic scale, there is no speed of the system. It's at rest. The macroscopic property is pressure. So the way you define the system at mi micro scale and macro scale are different. And that's the scaling, uh, the, the scaling which we see from micro to macro in a complex system like this. And we can study the same system at microscopic scale by defining some function of the speed and getting a pressure for the whole microscopic system. Similarly, in our day-to-day -day life, there are people who are doing some, who are taking some energy, like consuming food, uh, driving their cars, and going to work, like us, and producing some economic output for which they get paid. And what they are part of is an economic system which gives out the whole, uh, which defines the whole economic system in terms of GDP, and the whole system also takes some input if you add all people consuming energy, that's the input energy into the system. And then the output for that system is the GDP. So if we can get from micro to macro, the speed of colliding molecules to pressure, can we find uh, scaling between energy consumption and economic output of an individual 
in a country or an economy to the GDP and in, uh, input energy input of any whole economy. So that's the problem. Uh, let me start with the inspiration for the study. So this the study was inspired by the biological scaling of uh, uh, biological scaling between energy intake of organisms and their mass. So I want to pose this question. We have three dogs of 50 pounds each on the left and one 150 pound person on the right. Which group consumes more energy at faster rate? So this question can be answered easily using Kleiber's law. And Kleiber's law was published 80 years ago. So it's quite an old study. And using this law, you can easily answer this. Uh, what it says on the left is B. B is the metabolic energy consumption. Uh, C is some constant. M is the mass. And to the power three by four. So if you multiply a constant to the mass uh, and take the power of uh, mass to three, three by four of a mammal, it will give you the metabolic energy of that uh, group. So let's see. So for three dogs, we have three C because there are three dogs, three multiplied by C, 50 to the power three by four. For one male, we have C, 150, three fourth. Let's calculate it further. On the left, we have 56C and on the right, we have 42C. Hmm. So, the, so the group of dogs, they consume more energy uh, than one single man, even though they have same weight. And why is this happening? This happens because of several regions, uh, reasons and uh, many theories have been proposed, but the actual, it's, it's a highly debated topic, but the observation is the rate of consumption of energy does not grow as linearly with the growth of mass in mammals or uh, definitely in organisms. Let's see Kleiber's law plotted uh, the result of Kleiber, which he uh, presented initially. Uh, so we can see dog with the body weight 10 here, and it's lying over here on a log log scale. What about the human is up? And that's why the dogs, they consume at a higher rate, even with lower mass. And when you grow the mass, when the mass grows, the growth in energy consumption does not grow linearly, it reduces. So the same mass, the human consumes less. That's the idea. What happens if I change the metabolic energy with the consumption of energy by the whole country? So primary energy consumption, let me call this variable P. And then I change the mass with the GDP of the country. So I'm defining uh, a country in, like an organism. I'm abstracting a country behaving like an organism and applying the Kleiber's law. And I'm posing this question, what happens if I plot such data? So somebody did this in 2011, uh, Brown et al. They did that. Uh, they plotted the energy consumption on the y-axis and the size or the mass of the countries in terms of GDP on the x-axis. And they got this scaling of three fourth, approximately three fourth, 0 0.76, close enough. And these two studies are quite comparable. And the question many people ask themselves after that, why is there this sublinear scaling? So do economies also behave like organisms at some scale? And if they do, what's the reason? So when economies grow in size in GDP, their increase in energy consumption also does not grow linearly, it reduces. And what could be the reason? So that's the research question I want to investigate further. Uh, people have used several methods or ordinary differential equations uh, and like handy predator prey model. So most of these models are inspired by predator prey uh, equations, assuming that we as human are uh, the predators and we consume resources, which is nature. So predator prey dynamics in that sense. And because ODE models define the whole system on a, uh, on a general level, like taking macroscopic parameters, uh, they are mostly defined as a macro models. The other analog is defining the whole system as a micro model in terms of defining the individual 
individual particles or agents associated with the system and then giving them rules and actions and giving them properties as these agents perform some actions their properties change and you track the whole uh, track all the properties of these agents to come up with the macroscopic uh, state of the system so that's how agent based systems work so now once you have defined properties at the individual level like if you are tracking the speed of all these molecules in a box uh, and then coming up with the pressure so such studies are microscopic in, uh, in nature and one of the very uh, established uh, uh, established uh, branch of physics statistical mechanics already does that and they uh, they study ensemble of huge number of particles uh, inspired by that uh, Ludwig and Yakovenko in 2021, they did economic study and they replaced these colliding molecules with colliding people with some amount of energy, uh, some amount of money. And they replaced the momentum with the money they have. And they simulated the what happens to the overall, overall temperature of this system. And they could come up with a very, <laughs> a very interesting result that with randomly colliding people and exchanging money, it leads to severe inequality in the distribution of money. And we'll come, with, uh, come to that. So defining the system from my microscopic level in terms of uh, agent-based model is my choice of approach. And I am going to study Handy model, which, in, which is an ODE, which is a macro model. And I'll try to come up with the same result. And at least that's my effort of the handy ODE macro model from my microscopic approach. And this will be done basically to explore what kind of rules at microscopic level gives us the same result at the macroscopic level. So there can be several rules, but we want to find the interesting ones and explore them. So let's see the handy microscopic model. Uh, we have the handy model, which is a set of four ordinary differential equations. First is, uh, how is the population changing in the system? So population change is obviously birth minus death. So how many people are born and how many people are dead? And that will give you a change in the population of the system. Uh, the second system uh, of equation, the second equation is how the nature is changing. So uh, essentially people are consuming nature and then they are doing their economic activities. So nature is also regenerating with time. So. So nature is regenerating and this there is extraction being done by the agents so the change in, in uh, change in nature is regeneration minus extraction uh, handy model also says that when the nature is extracted or resources extracted people create wealth so that's extraction so how is wealth changing in the system well there is extraction of the nature and then the agents consume some or here people consume some so on macroscopic level, extraction minus consumption is change in wealth. So essentially these ODEs define the handy ODE model. What happens uh, canonically in the agent-based model? So in the agent-based model, we have agents like workers and they perform actions. They perform actions like reproduce and die. And uh, let me put some further light how they do it. So in an agent-based model, to have a birth, uh, an agent will throw a die with some probability that if they throw one one, they will give a birth as they won't. And this brings a stochasticity because sometimes you won't throw the die uh, one one, you won't get one one, and sometimes you will. What about death rules? So you can set a death rule like, okay, if you throw two, three, you will die. Otherwise you won't die. And these kind of simple rules, which agent will perform, and then it will dictate their birth and death. What about in uh, the ODE model? So in OD ODE model, it's macroscopic rules. So let's say 3% of 11 people living right now will give birth and 1% of 11 people will die, then change in population is 0 0.22. And that's a weird number to have because 0 0.22 people cannot change. It's quite a continuous number. However, in ABM, 
that's not possible. You either give birth or you don't, you either die or you don't. So there is some amount of discreteness in ABM, which is not in uh, ODEs. And that can essentially uh, dictate the differences in the models. So let me explain further what, what is happening. So in uh, ODE macroscopic model, change in population is birth minus death. How does birth change? So the workers throw a die. If they throw a die to reproduce, luckily they reproduce. So this changes. If they throw a die so that they don't die, this changes or this doesn't change. And all the agents do this and the cumulative effect is seen in this equation. So that's how they, uh, the macro, macro model and the micro model can get into sync and produce same result. Similarly, regeneration, nature regeneration is an action performed by the nature. And then this number changes and extraction is done by the agent. Extract, some rule is set. Extraction changes by all the uh, agents and that changes the nature. Similarly, extraction by agent, consumption by agent, nothing to do with nature, only agents decide this parameter, and that's how it's done. The conversion between handy uh, ODE and ABM. So the model which I will present will be handy ABM. So the conversion of handy ordinary differential equation into the handy uh, agent-based model. And this model assumes that there is a common wealth that all the agents extract the nature and the nature is extracted to become wealth and then they consume that wealth. And when all the agents uh, extract that nature, that wealth, which is accumulated now is common. So everybody can share from it. Everybody can consume that wealth. It doesn't belong to anybody. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a common wealth. It's for everyone. And uh, there is no, uh, there is no concept of space. So there is nature is at one place and everybody is living at one place and they are consuming. Uh, and they are not doing transaction. They are just eating from a common pile. And note that I will only discuss steady state results. So steady state means the variables defining the system like the amount of people or the wealth and nature at some point, it won't change. It will, it will be almost constant. The dynamics in the model will go on, but it won't change. Uh, the second model which I will discuss is when the agents have individual wealth. So uh, in handy mod ODE model, ordinary differential equation uh, model, which is a macroscopic model, the wealth belongs to the common pool. Like I, like I explained, it's uh, the nature is extracted and the wealth is at one place. But in ABM, you can give parameters to each agent. So what I did, I changed it to, okay, now, when you extract wealth, you can have wealth and you consume your own wealth. So that a modification I did, and that's handy ABM version two, which I'll discuss. The third variation, which I will discuss of the uh, handy model is now that you have your own wealth, what about you do transactions? And you do transaction with a uh, random other agent and you can define simple or complex type of transaction and see what kind of result it brings in the macroscopic result of the economy. So let's see. Uh, so model one is handy microscopic model. How does it compare to the OD macroscopic model? And the assumption is nature is at one place, there is no movement and that's it. Let's see. So on the, so the dashed lines show the ODE model and the solid lines uh, show the handy ABM model. And you can see, obviously there is some amount of difference, but the nature of each plot is same. So on the leftmost and top is the amount of populations, the number of agents living in the system. It increases initially because there is nature to extract. So people extract nature and then they reproduce and they keep going on until there is not enough nature and then the birth and death come to a sink and same amount of people are living. Similarly, same for the nature comes to a steady state, wealth comes to a steady state. And then for consumption, consumption is actually a function of number of agents. So if you have more agents, more consumption, a sustenance cost is a fixed number. So some number of agents, some fixed number of uh, sustenance, which they uh, consume at each tick. 
and global economic factor, which is like, if there is less money for everyone, everybody reduce their consumption. So, so in ODE, there is always a higher result and ABM it's slightly less. And this could be because of the discreteness in the model, which I said that only uh, integer or uh, only discrete number of people are born. And there is also a factor that if the first, uh, if the first agent consumes a fraction of nature, now there is less available for the next agent and then the next agent. So there are two, two primary reasons why there is some difference and that's the way it is. Uh, in terms of consumption and population, you can see the ODE, the ODE model produces some amount of non-linearity and ABM, it's like almost linear. What if the agents have individual wealth now? Now they don't have common wealth. They are not consuming from a pile. They have their own individual wealth. They extract the nature and then they consume it. And if they have extra to save, they save it. And then they add on to that pile. So when they have individual wealth, so the individual wealth result is the dashed line and the solid lines are when, when they have common wealth. So for the individual wealth case, I chose a depletion factor of two third than in the common wealth. So what is depletion factor? The depletion factor is how much of the available nature you are consuming. Uh, let's say I have 10 unit of nature available to me. And if I'm consuming five units every tick, then when I have individual wealth, I had to reduce it. I had to reduce it to, let's say, two units of well, uh, nature at each tick. Why? Because it brings an oscillation in the system and the, the system does not give a steady state result. And there is a reason behind it. And I can explain it further uh, when the questions come comes up. So in the case of individual result, the population is always lower. If you want to get to a steady state, if, uh, if you keep the depletion factor same, it can go higher, but the system will oscillate. The population will grow high and then come down and up and down and that kind of result. So one more interesting factor, which you can see in consumption versus population is uh, the system shows linear growth in consumption versus population, which is how much the energy is consuming. The previous graph, which we explained the Kleiber's law and the population, which is the size of the economy here. So it's showing a linear behavior when the economy has common wealth, but when you give them individual wealth, some slight non-linearity non comes into the picture. Uh, let me compare this with something which is in, which has been seen in the global economy. This is a picture actually from uh, Dr. King's publication. Uh, so you can see before 1970s from 1900, the exponent is almost to the power one and grows linearly. And after 1970s in the real world data of the global economic energy consumption versus global economy size GDP, it's not linear. The exponent is 0 0.67. Could there be a reason why this happened for commonwealth, like people initially had commonwealth and then the economy became more decentralized and people are having more individual wealth. So interesting question, which can be seen in uh, something can, that can be seen in ABM models when the, model, uh, when the wealth is decentralized in economy. Now that agents have individual wealth, I wanted to make them do transaction. So I started with the simplest transaction is, uh, I arbitrarily chose two agents, one winner, one loser, and the winner will gain some money and the loser will lose some money. No external money comes in the economy and that is not allowed. So if you don't have enough money to lose, you don't lose, you, have, you keep that money. So the result is the maximum is when there is commonwealth and there is no transaction. And when there is transaction and people have individual wealth, the results of population and wealth, uh, nature is all the same even consumption versus population is the same. 
but the interesting thing is in, in the wealth distribution. So when there is no transaction between the agents, uh, this is the distribution of wealth among the population. So close to a normal distribution, maybe not, but kind of looks like a normal distribution. But the Gini coefficient, which is a index used to study inequality in income of this distribution of wealth is 0 0.067. Gini coefficient varies between zero to one. Close to zero is perfect equality. Close to one is uh, one is actually perfect inequality. So almost people have good, th this system has good equality, but as you make them transact randomly, just random pair of agents transacting money becoming winner or loser, there's a huge inequality in the system. So even simple rule can bring uh, inequality in the economic system. That's the point I'm trying to make here. So what is the final takeaway? Takeaway is that ABM models can replicate the macro handy E model, uh, handy ODE model. And that was our first uh, step to do because we wanted to take our approach from mac micro level to uh, macro studies. And yeah, we achieved that. Uh, ABM uh, models can also give you additional extension, at least the ability to extend the model at micro level, like assigning them individual wealth and then have them ability to do transaction. More complex transaction can also be done, like people can own share of common wealth and then have that wealth grow and down and just earn through that. So that can be done. Uh, there are assumption of having individual wealth and then common wealth and how that affects the scaling of consumption uh, versus the size of the economy. And I showed that how it brings non-linearity non when the wealth is decentralized. And that is something which you can see in ABM models, and which I have simulated. And that is also a feature which can be seen in the real world data, which I showed. So. Uh, Further, we need more different kinds of agents and different sectors of people doing different things and uh, having more complex transactions to get better inside uh, to simulate a real world economy and get a picture of energy and economic coupling. But my final, uh, the final takeaway, which I want everybody to take from this presentation is economies behave like organisms at some abstraction level in terms of consuming energy and then sustaining economic processes like having some GDP while also trying to grow under resource pressures. Like now we have less oil and gas and then that brings us some resource pressure and the economies grow in a certain way. Uh, and that way economies behave like organisms. And that's the prime takeaway of this whole presentation. And uh, that makes studying of the scaling of energy consumption versus GDP of economy is very intriguing and fundamental. Please reach out to me if you have a question now or later. Uh, this is my email ID, sarab.utexas.edu. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Suma. Uh, Bala, turn yourself back on here and we'll uh, address some questions. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of questions that are kind of directed at Bala. So um, I think maybe you can answer two of these at the same time, perhaps. So. Um, one is kind of, you know, have you, you showed an abstract, uh, I guess, simple network models and, uh, have you tried it with the real transmission grid or how would you think about using your technique with real, the real data about how the transmission grid is actually connected and, oh, maybe we'll just start with that one, I guess. But. Yeah. So, so far we have not tried, uh, with, uh, re real transmission grid simulation. Actually, it's a one. It's a work in progress. We are exploring uh, that possibility whether we can uh, we, we can extend that to a real grid simulation. Uh, in some ways, we can say that the binary tree topology resembles close to our electricity grid somewhat. So uh, yeah, at present we are exploring that option, but still we have not uh, tried with a real grid simulation. Right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think you kind of answered a little bit there. One of the other questions of, uh, yeah, which do you prefer the binary tree or lattice? But I guess the uh, the answer now is that these are representations so that we can 
we can help understand the real world grid, I suppose, right? How do, how do we think about that? But for example, binary tree, we can think of a community microgrid in a community and the houses are closed. That, that's like a, that's like a, that's, in that case, we can say that the question is here, which is preferable? A binary tree might be the preferable because it's in a community microgrid. So the thing with the rectangular lattice is like for powering a city, we are doing with a single large resource. In that case, the rectangular lattice is more, more or like, what to say, more or like is preferred. But you know, for a binary tree, it's like a community microgrid. Right. Uh, Suman, I'll, yeah, go ahead, turn yourself on. I'll kind of ask a question here. So you got to the end. I think one of the interesting things is you're combining, essentially you're combining the idea of transactions amongst agents with the same idea of an economy that depends upon a resource that can be depleted. Was, was the, um, the result that you get, let's just say, a higher Gini coefficient or a less equal society once you have transactions? Was that is that something expected from literature or is that a surprise? Oh, uh, it's, it's slightly surprising and also expected from literature. So the study by Yakovenko says that, yeah, arbitrarily uh, random agents exchanging money uh, produce an equal distribution of uh, wealth or money in, in my system wealth and in their system money. So I was expecting this, but they have uh, a definite amount of wealth, which does not change in the system, but this system is also growing or declining. So I was surprised to see that it also similar to what they got for a constant economy. And my system is growing and declining and I still get the same result. Right. Yeah. So I'm kind of excited about pursuing the idea you just said there, which is, uh, yeah, to track how something like the wealth distribution changes as the economy is growing versus not. And here's a, here's a question to kind of follow up on your, on your, on your presentation is the transaction model or the idea of transactions is that done with both the assumption that there's a common pool of wealth and also the individual wealth, or is it only one or the other where that works? Uh, so only when the agents can have individual wealth, they can do transaction. So, if there is a common pool, they cannot take money from the common pool and do transaction because then the money will fall back again to the common pool. So that transaction will not make much sense. So only if you own your own wealth and you have your saving because no debt is allowed. So only if you have enough, then you can do transaction. So yes, that's also a very interesting point that what happens if debt, debt is allowed. So yeah, I haven't done that, but some, something interesting to pursue. Uh, right, that's a good that's a good point. At some level, this is kind of like the simplest, or not the maybe one of one of the simplest ideas we can have about private ownership versus not you know, or common ownership. So it allows you to play with that very general idea. So uh, back to Bala, uh, there's a there's a question uh, person on YouTube. Thank you for um, if we think about increasing capabilities to be able to generate electricity or store electricity more locally or more distributed at smaller scales. Um, how does this, how do you think about this increased capability of distributed generation in the kind of work you're doing? And I know this is, I guess this is near and dear to uh, Dr. Hassenbein's uh, desires for this uh, work, right? Yeah, so that is, that is for example, uh, the best solution will be uh, placing, have giving every home a battery. So in that case, for example, in the binary tree, we are placing the battery at the la last node that is closer to the customers. That is every home is having a battery. So in the event of a disaster, like two to two, three days, we can have all the basic re requirements, for electricity, we can be satisfied with a battery. However, whether it is possible in the real time, the cost, whether every home able to afford, that is a question. So that's why what to say, we are trying to find a, optimal placement, whether to give it for an area or a community, something like that. But the optimum will be every home having a battery. Right. And I think uh, you can you can help me clarify from my understanding of your work that you, you have a parameter in there that says, well, if I install a, a power plant or a generator at a very low level node or like a, a big 
you know, backbone piece of the transmission grid, you know, it might cost some whatever dollar per kilowatt or rating or something like this, you know, thousand dollars a kilowatt. And part of what you're trying to understand is well, how much cheaper or how much more expensive can it be on a dollar per kilowatt basis to install distributed generation so that that becomes a more optimal solution to maintain grid reliability, right? Or you're trying to understand that trade-off of the cost and where the generator is actually placed. Yeah, actually that is the problem here. For example, uh, what to say, what we found placing, a, if there is a high probability of consumer having power, then placing the resource, placing a single generator and then providing power to all the homes is the optimal. But in the real world, that's not possible. It's not that all the all the lines, edges are going to, our grids are going to work. So in that case, how close we can go close to the customers or we are trying to find the trade off going to the customers Again, if you are having a higher probability, like we are, we are coming back. What to say? We are being close to the node. If we are the probability is low, then we are going close to the customers, and then the cost is getting higher. So, if there is more distributed, the cost is increasing. Right. Yeah. And it sounds like do you? I'll say something, and you can tell me if I'm correct. That you have some intuitive results there, which are if yeah, if the grid is not very. This is kind of what you're saying. If the individual links of the grid are not very reliable, then it starts. You start to have a higher benefit ratio of installing distributed generation. Uh, but we have a relatively, uh, to this date, still in the United States, a very relatively high reliable grid in terms of the power lines. So in that sense, it's why we've been able to have generators, a very small number of generators that are centralized. Is that correct? Yeah. Does that make sense? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the point. If the if there is a high reliability, then the single resource, what was it, one centralized resource will be able to power the grid. But if the reliability is reducing, we are finding the we are going closer to the customers to find the optimal place, then there is a trade-off. You are going to pay higher for having a higher probability of having power for highly reliable grid. Right, so we're getting some, even though you have a stylized model, if you will, you're getting some intuitive results out of it that uh, I think we can apply to the to the real electric grid. So yeah. I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, this seems to be the questions we have. I don't know if you have any anything else either of you would like to say about the presentations or takeaways or ask each other a question, but it seems to be where oh, we're at now. Any, any closing remarks? Um, so the code for, the agent-based model, which I have, uh, is also shared on GitHub. Feel free to use it, and please feel free to contribute to improve it. So that's right. Uh, we'll put a link to that on our micro uh, to macro website. And uh, so, yeah, via the Energy Institute website, energy.utexas.edu, we have a link to the macro, micro to macro program, and we'll link uh, their work and any papers that come out of the work of Bala and Suman. So. Um, everyone, uh, thank you very much for joining us today uh, in the UT Energy Symposium. So Dr. Pala Subramanian Sambasimam and Dr. Suman Sura, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.